All right, I don't wanna waste any of this, this hour, so I'll get us started. Thank you for attending today's Self Talk. Before I introduce my friend and colleague who will then introduce today's guest, I want to remind you about next week's Self Talk, co-sponsored by the Mississippi Humanities Council, featuring University of Mississippi alum and Associate Professor of History at Tougaloo College, Dr. Daphne Chamberlain. Dr. Chamberlain's talk, The Emmett Till Generation, Youth Activism, Radical Protest, and Social Change in Jim Crow, Mississippi, will take place on Wednesday, February 24th at noon. You can register on the center's website. I will share those details in a bit in the chat. Today's South Talk is co-sponsored by the University of Mississippi English Department and MFA program, Thank you all for your partnership and support of the Center Self Talk series. I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Dare Carell. Dare Carell is the Ottilie Schillig Associate Professor of English and African American Studies here at the University of Mississippi. His poem collections are Cotton, Ropes, and Strip Room Wonderland. His poems, stories, and essays have been published widely. Derek will introduce Frank X. Walker and facilitate the Q&A. Thank you both in advance for what I know will be a great discussion. Thank you, Afton. Um, obviously, I want to thank you, Afton Thomas and uh, Katie McKee and the Center for the Study of Southern Culture here at the University of Mississippi. It's an honor and a privilege today to be with um, my friend and brother, Frank X. Walker. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Frank's. Uh, the first African-American writer to be named Kentucky Poet Laureate. Frank X. Walker is professor of English and African-American and Africana studies at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, where he founded Pluck, which is an outstanding journal, a uh, journal of Appalachian, Appalachian arts and culture. He has published 11 collections of poetry, including Turn Me Loose, The Unghosting of Medgar Evers, which was awarded an NAACP Image Award for Poetry, and the Black Caucus American Library Association Honor Award for Poetry. He is also the author of Buffalo Dance, The Journey of York, winner of the Lillian Smith Book Award, and Isaac Murphy, I Dedicate This Ride, which he adapted for stage voted one of the most creative professors in the South, Walker, a Danville native, coined the term Appalachia and co-founded the Appalachian Poets, which I am uh, proudly a member of. Kave um, Khanum Fellow, his honors includes a Latin Literary Fellowship for Poetry. His most recent collection, which is outstanding, I just revisited it this morning, is uh, called Mass Man Black pandemic and protest poems. Uh, just as something that's a little bit less formal, Frank X. Walker is a dear friend of mine, a mentor and a model for not only me, but a, a lot of us writers. And um, I have to add one of the coolest cats I know. So without further ado, I give you all Frank X. Walker. Thanks, D. Thanks, Afton. Wow, what a what a cold place to be this time of the year for a reading. And I so wish I was there in person to, to be with all of you and to spend some time uh, in your in your city uh, campus. But um, that's post COVID. You know, I'm trying to invite myself back in advance. Um, I'm just gonna read and and. Um, we'll entertain some questions afterwards. Uh, you probably already know I'm reading from Mask Man. Black uh, pandemic and protest poems. Uh, the only thing I would say in advance of, of this is that uh, this is probably the the quickest from first poem to finished book project I've ever been part of. And I didn't even start writing these initially thinking about a book project. I just started last April trying to document uh, what was happening in the world uh, because of COVID and the pandemic, and because there was so much happening in the news uh, that it was difficult to process. And for me, I'm one of those poets who 
who probably only pour it because they can't afford a therapist. And the page always is kinder to me than, than the news uh, and allows me to work some things out. So what I'm gonna to read to you uh, are excerpts from this collection that doesn't just document the pandemic, but uh, even offers the, what I consider the silver linings that became part of it for, I think many people, uh, especially those individuals who, whose lives were in such a hurry that, you know, you, you were partnered with somebody you maybe only saw face to face uh, a couple of hours a day, or, you know, you were the parent of little people that you saw in the morning and late at night. Uh, and suddenly you have them 24 hours a day for seven days a week. And uh, the potential strains on these new relationships, I imagine some people did not survive. Uh, families may be ripped apart, you know. In some cases, I consider myself one of the lucky ones. Um, all of my relationships that matter deepened. Um, and so some of the, the quote unquote love poems that come in the middle of this pandemic and protests uh, that was happening, that was erupting around the, the world, uh, are those moments of sweetness, of uh, resolve, of, of calmness, of you know, bringing me back to center uh, in a way that I hope will sound familiar to you too. So I'm just gonna start reading this first one uh, it's actually called Silver Linings. Silver Linings. Remembering you actually like your family, love your partner, and being outdoors barefooted, finishing the unread stack of books, cooking without using a microwave, and writing letters longhand. Noticing that watching listening or playing in the rain feels the exact opposite of driving in it. Meeting the old you, the cloud watching wannabe gardener before time clocks and hurry, bills and worry made you a prisoner, took your life hostage, replaced it with cable, a big screen and a remote control. One of the things that I guess is, is the highlight for me um, is all the extra time, uh, almost a second honeymoon, uh, is what we tried to make the best out of the challenge of indoors, or outdoors. This is called baptism by dirt. One of the things that we found ourselves doing is looking for something as an outlet. Uh, and there's nothing more powerful than putting your hands in the dirt uh, being outside, growing your own food. And I've forgotten how restorative this had been for me and my family and hadn't had a garden in so long. I didn't even remember what I was doing until we broke ground. My wife is from Jamaica. Uh, so it was a new experience for her to grow um, food in this part of the country. You know, we, we, we could not plant papaya and bananas and mangoes. Uh, could not thrive in Kentucky's uh, unkind climate. Um, you know, her parents live in Florida and her mother's backyard is, is a fruit preserve. I mean, I love visiting just to, to, to pick ripe fruit from, the, from her backyard. But these are mostly vegetables. This is called baptism by dirt for Shauna. All believers know about the power of water, though not enough about the power of dirt. My mama used to walk barefooted in our vegetable garden, get down on her hands and knees and almost pray in the dirt. My wife and I and our two-year-old built and planted three raised bed gardens. Watching her dip her fingers into the dirt to coddle what will feed us reminds me of mama and then what is it that women know about nurturing a seed into a piece of fruit, about believing in the power of dirt and suns and water? I return from our labor with sore knees and back, fingernails and hands caked with dirt. She floats back into the house, cleaner, somehow less burdened, 
as if she spent the weekend burying all of her heavy things, as if she whispered to something sacred and it whispered something back. So that's some of the upside, um, you know, of this, the pandemic, you know, as it was raging in April and into May um, and June, I was still writing these poems, a poem a day, trying to process all this work. Um, you know, I'll read a couple of poems that come from the other side of the lining, not so silver. When I started reading and hearing about what was happening in assisted living facilities and senior citizens homes and uh, nursing homes, this is called Old School Math. Life in most assisted living facilities and nursing homes is just like wintering in Florida, minus the big house near the beach, enough money for a private duty nurse and a kind Jamaican woman to attend to all your needs. Though not quite prisoners, many residents are confined to hospital beds, barely ambulatory or locked forever out of their minds and receive few or no visitors. Mama checked her own mother out of the facility where her siblings had put her. She set up a hospital bed in our living room, made us use the back door to come and go until granny went. If she were alive today, mama would have a grandmother in every room and be Clorox wiping everything. Coronavirus be damned. She knew poor, broken and old did not mean indignity, and it certainly didn't equal death. Mm. A lot of things came straight from the news. I remember hearing about um, the corporations who had been accused of, of using racist um, images to, to peddle their products over the years. Uh, finally, during this, this new season of, of, of reckoning, acknowledging that it was true and um, committing to do something about it. So this comes out of one of those headlines. And it also pulls in some of the major events uh, from this other season, you, which you may recognize from the references, but it's called Mrs. Butterworth, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima. Mrs. Butterworth, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima, walk into a bar in America. Butterworth says, I'm being repackaged. Ben says, I'm being rebranded. Jemima says, I remember when they branded my mama on her back. The bartender says, I could stand in the middle of Main Street and kill somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. Butterworth says, then I'll take eight bullets in my sleep. Ben says, choke me to death with your knee. Jemima says, lock me in a holding cell and say I decided to hang myself. The bartender poured the drinks, said he felt threatened and was simply standing his ground when he thought the thug was reaching for a gun. The headline said, well-loved American foods resisted arrest, failed to comply and were delicious while black. Butterworth's daughter said, here's the progress. We might finally get an anti-lynching bill. Ben's son said, I'd rather they abolish qualified immunity. Jemima's kid said, you know, they abolished slavery once, then they hung my mama on that box. You know, some of these subjects are, are harder to talk about um, but I could not leave out the George Floyd incident, um, but I wanted to do it in a way that will let people get through the poem um, completely, uh, in a way that might be compelling at least. This is a poem called Complicit at Most, and it's from the point of view of George Floyd's assassin's knee. Complicit at Most, a persona poem. I am no more guilty than the officer's eyes choosing to look the other way, 
Technically, I'm not even touching his neck. All I could feel was the hot cotton insides of Officer Chauvin's slacks against my skin. Almost nine minutes is a long time to kneel on a neck, especially if you are unaccustomed to praying or begging. But after pressing all of me down, he put this all on me as if he was planning to propose, but got cold feet and was too embarrassed to get up and just walk away from this altar. Cation marrying us both to this moment till death do us part. I'll let that one soak in, even for me, uh, very difficult subject. You know, after reading what was happening in meat packing plants and recognizing that, uh, you know, the workers there had been declared essential workers and as much as they needed more PPE, um, they were not allowed to slow down their, their production uh, because America needed meat uh, on our tables. Uh, my father worked in a slaughterhouse um, meat processing plant when I was a kid. So this is called Ode to Meat Packers. Oh, you of tired feet, sore hands, weary second shift eyes and darker minimum wage skin. The executive order signed by the president to keep your plants open, to keep meat in grocery stores and on America's tables, despite the need for more spacing on your lines personal protection equipment, more sanitizing stations and barriers to separate workers, at least implies you are now essential. Forget the ice raids, families at the border and children still in cages. Ignore the prioritizing of beef over ventilators, pork over vaccines and poultry over tests. Now that it's considered patriotic for somebody to die for the economy, take heart. In case you missed out on a signed stimulus check, his autograph on the order makes it clear that he takes responsibility this time and almost acknowledges your sacrifice and your place in the supply chain to satisfy America's appetite. One of the things about um, this time period, especially last Easter was recognizing how things had changed uh, in our family. I'm one of 11 and every holiday is a, is a huge family reunion for us. Uh, Thanksgiving usually draws almost 60 people uh, and that's not counting, uh, you know, the extra people who just come along because they heard about how my sisters cook. Um, but I didn't go to Easter dinner last year because of COVID. Um, but my family, who live in a smaller town than I do currently, my, my hometown, actually, Danville, Kentucky, they still had Easter dinner. Uh, and I was doubly concerned. We were very concerned because they also weren't wearing masks. They didn't believe uh, that COVID was anything but a hoax then. And, and they teased us relentlessly uh, all through the summer for being so, uh, in their opinion, overzealous about uh, this pandemic. Um, all of which they are regretful now, but this is called Easter Prayer uh, 2020 AC. The AC is for after Corona. Um, this is probably the closest to humor uh, these poems get. Easter Prayer 2020 AC, it is a prayer. All powerful black Jesus, please protect my brothers and sisters and their families and friends. When they gather together illegally to enjoy Easter dinner, and a Sabbath. May they pass around the sanitizer after holding hands in prayer. May whoever is lifting up your name be wearing a mask correctly, O oh Lord. May any pork that touches their lips not mess with their blood pressure. Hide the salt, sweet Jesus, and please grant them the vision to bring at least one sugar-free dessert, some diet sodas, and unsweetened tea. Strengthen them for the fight against that devil diabetes and all cancers, Lord. Thank you for their own time unemployment checks, Medicaid and Obamacare. Help them choose wisely if the choice is between the cable and light bill 
and their life insurance. And if it is your will to take all of their asses because they refuse to believe COVID is real, let this be the best meal they ever ate, Lord. And take them all on the same day so that they may offer comfort to each other in the hospital and allow the rest of us to endure only one drive through service. Amen. They didn't think that was funny. Uh, then a little bit now, um, humor and sarcasm has been, you know, I think one of the, one of the survival tools for a lot of people. Uh, here's a poem from a collection called I'm Being Sarcastic and it's a tribute to my uh, our almost three year old. We still call him two, but he's almost three in two months. I'm being sarcastic. Our two-year-old grabbed the mic, pronounced his uneaten slice of watermelon a boat, and sailed it off his plate onto the dark blue sea table mat, becoming the after-dinner entertainment instead of the evening press conference. And as soon as we were all convinced he was right, he picked it up, smiled slyly, took two quick bites, and pronounced it a race car. I thought, my God, he could be president. As I imagined him in a big red tie instead of his signature bib, the second ever toddler to take a dump in the Oval Office. We all thought telling little white lies and dressing up like a clown was cute until that German kid opened up her real science kit. Our problem child makes unflyable paper planes out of the Constitution, uses fat crayons to color his talking points pretends to know more than all the experts and waits for the adults in the room to clean up after his latest mess. One of the things about the protest that I had a lot of respect for was how, how diverse it was and how many young people were dominating uh, the front lines and the back lines and the middle and the energy of the protests. Uh, so this is a poem after Amiri Baraka and it's, it's for all those young people. It's called Combustibles. Who already sick and tired of the plan, the new normal? Who won't change? Who demand justice now? Who know their lives matter? Who die the most at the hands of cops? Who speak riot, sing protest, and shout uprising? Who they say loot and be made to look less righteous? Who set police cars ablaze? Who grieve with bricks, water bottles, and fire? Who eat pepper spray, flashbangs, and tear gas for dinner? Who say defund the police and fuck their curfew? Who burn the target and the precinct down? Who ready to be the next hashtag? For those frontline social justice workers. One of the things that I missed most about last summer was not going to an outdoor concert. It's one of our favorite things to do is to pick, get a picnic together and take the whole family and sit out at a Shakespeare in the Park or an outdoor performance, uh, take our own tent and you know, spend the whole evening, uh, part of the afternoon in, in those spaces. But it didn't happen last summer. Uh, I'm old school enough to appreciate uh, DJ battles uh, on turntables, you know, this, dates me and some of you listeners, but uh, this is called DJ Battle uh, with an epigraph that's a quote from President DJ Trump. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. DJ Battle. The oppressor's private property is always more important to the privileged. Their power is what police protect. Backed by a National Guard fronting a commander in cheat known to incite and encourage violence against POC by the FOP and other good people versus thugs. If you don't understand this behavior or these people, you don't understand emotional or psychological trauma. You don't understand generational grief. And you really don't understand injustice or American history. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace, just ice raids, not guilty cops, just us dead, dying, and chalk marked over and over again, like some whack DJ rewinding the bridge or dead refrain scratching at our eyes with 
already viral breathless black body porn professionally made by the hands, feet, and now knees of thug police again. Instead of turning the tables, we drag out turntables and spin and spin and spin, searching old wax, seeking to sample something human, anything truly good to mix with this black in our lives until we matter. Flip through here, check the time. Okay, you read about three more and I'll release you. Um, I'm compelled to read the title poem called Masked Man Black uh, after Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, um, We Were the Mask. I hope you are familiar with it. Masked Man Black. This poem came out of a real experience. The first time I walked into the local grocery store in the daytime uh, with my mask on uh, and how people responded to me. Black male me walks into a store in broad daylight, black phone in hand, wearing a black mask. You already know how this ends. Somebody felt threatened, somebody got shot. Black woman wailing makes news, but it isn't new. All the chalk outlines are white, all the states are red. The coronavirus doesn't discriminate, racists still do. Peel off mask, no grins, no lies. All right. Um, choices, choices. Okay, so two more. Uh, this next poem comes out of my friend Ricardo Nazario Colon, um, who has the most wicked sense of humor that I know of any person. He's always, his humor always borders on tasteless. And it's the timing of, we may be on the way back from the funeral before he makes a joke about the deceased. And so we always get used to saying it's too soon, too soon to him. Uh, so this poem is called Too Soon with a question mark. So a smallpox blanket, a Tuskegee experiment and a Republican governor all walk into a bar in Atlanta. It seems that everything, even the dark and the difficult was funnier before COVID-19 if left to real comedians. Dave Chappelle's blind black Klansman skit interrogated the complexities of race and the irrationality of American racism. Richard Pryor's personal struggle with addiction offered up humor born out of darkness and pain. They were rarely silly and goofy for saccharine's sake. Never mean-spirited, targeting someone less fortunate just for laughs. Making comedy self-deprecating without becoming minstrelsy is an art form, is a gift. We won't know if we can really survive the coronavirus until somebody makes a joke and it only hurts a little. So I started uh, in a warm place and I, I'm on, I'll end there. Um, it's another poem for Shauna. This is called Corona Love. Our stay-at-home order has become a civil lining. Suddenly, we cannot just take our time with things that matter, with everything we may have taken for granted. Saturday, for example, my wife and I made love all day. And I don't mean we locked ourselves in our bedroom for hours and hours, stayed naked, and you know. I mean, all the kids slept in, so we didn't rush either. We took our time, we kissed, I mean really kissed, no pecs, no smooches, we kissed deep and long and we meant it. I have to admit that the way the machine ran around here pre-corona, we were lucky to get a peck in before getting four of us off in four different directions to four different places all before 8 a.m. A measly peck on those mornings had to last all day. So we didn't just kiss. We lingered in each other's arms, a place we found ourselves still clinging to after digesting the previous day's body count and news. 
trying to verbalize our worst fears as the headlines got closer and closer to our front door. We save everything now. We know that if one of us gets sick, there would be nothing but difficult choices to follow. If any of our kids were stricken and we were told we couldn't be at their bedside, what then? We hugged and flirted through breakfast. We held hands, sent private messages, planned a naked nap to coincide with our two-year-old sleep time. The few we know who are dying will soon become many. We know there will be more funerals we can't attend. The impending loss is so heavy, it's hard to keep convincing the teenagers that the homework, which used to feel like life and death, is just that serious right now. So we smile and wink and touch and hug and kiss and squeeze and cry and laugh every chance we get. We don't know what's coming and who's going or if we will be among them. So take our advice. If you wake up already where you want to be and don't have to rush anywhere, recognize it as a gift. Take your time, linger, wallow, forget finishing. Don't stop, leave a tender bookmark and come back as soon as you can. Thank you, thank you for listening. Uh, I will invite Derek, back in this conversation, uh, to interrogate me in these poems. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Um, that was that was fantastic. I feel like it's um, you know, even though this is virtual, I feel like it's been a while since I've I've listened to you read, and and you know, every time it hits the same, it hits the same. Um, so thank you for that. And this isn't even a question, but I just found it really interesting with the, um, the title poem, Masked Man Black, right? Um, and the allusion to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Um, you talking about the first time that you went into, into public with a mask on. And I remember thinking when, when we were told to wear masks as a black man, like, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I'm not comfortable making a... Uh, a societal image of me that I've already, that has already existed since before me, making them uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all become uncomfortable. That could potentially have bad implications for someone that looks like me. Say it. For sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Like I connected with that extremely, extremely. Um, I wanted to ask you this question though. So here's, here's a question. As I was revisiting the book this morning, there was this sort of recurring theme that, that, that kept kind of coming back. And um, it was kind of this theme of, about technology and social media. And there seemed to be this sort of nostalgia for like, I don't know if it's simpler times or times when we didn't you know, constantly have our phones in our faces or we weren't always on social media. Um, and so my question is, was that something that you've been thinking about for quite some time? I know social media has been a while for around for a while. So is that something that you've been thinking about for quite some time? Or did it become amplified through the, the writing process and being quarantined in the pandemic? You know, was was that sort of theme something that that changed during the pandemic? I thank you for that question. And as I think about, you know, where to start with the answer, uh, I mentioned we have teenage girls. Uh, so the conversation about the power of that cell phone and the impossibility of wedging it out of their hands, even while eating, uh, you know, they switch hands and I'm like, do you take it in the shower? And they say, well, we listen to music on it. You know, it's like it has become this extra limb uh, on, on the bodies of, and then, you know, we were trapped in a situation where we were Zooming uh, all of our meetings from home, teaching from home. So our two-year-old was watching all of us tied to a device and a screen. And at one point, he had a book and he turned it sideways of, and he was pretending to type. And he said, I'm working, I'm working. Of, and it was brilliant and it hurt at the same time. Of, as you know, we realized, realized how complicit we were in this idea of, of being enslaved to technology. 
Um, so that theme, that recurring theme is, is definitely in, in there. I, I think there might be a half dozen poems that talk about or imagine a simpler time uh, that even predict what, what post COVID uh, life will look like, you know, that, you know, I, I'm hoping to subtly urge an appreciation for, for gardening and, and feeding birds and, and long walks without technology. Uh, you know, I imagined, you know, I heard somebody mention that the thing they miss most was hugging people that they care about. And I was like, damn, that's, yes. And I, so I imagine, you know, an extended COVID that went on a decade of what it would do to sports, what it would do to, uh, to individual lives, how masks would, uh, would continue to evolve and then how classism would eventually kick in and what they would look like, you know, what education would look like between the have and the have nots and how that affected everything when I thought about it. Uh, and at one point I even imagined the new museums, um, you know, built in the space of what used to be uh, libraries and, and restaurants uh, and, and arenas. Uh, there were now museum spaces where people go to, uh, you know, experience what a hug used to feel like. Um, you know, and it, it sounds bizarre, but I, was, but I thought this thing, if this thing goes on, you know, the very, the most simplistic, beautiful, necessary things we take for granted, I mean, could become uh, the most desired, you know, so I tried to, to, to get ahead of even what sports would look like, you know, I, I laughed, my wife teases me, I mean, I predicted what uh, watching sports on TV looks like, what the arenas look like, and one of those poems talks about having the images of fans not the fans, but the images of them in the seats uh, and being able to view from home the event uh, from, from the actual seat. They haven't figured that out yet. They need to read my book. Uh, and so th then everybody can have a, a courtside seat, you know, um, but there are some channels that you can choose which view you want from the back of the top of the backboard or from the top middle of the arena. Uh, so they've got that technology already out there. But I think for me, it just, sent me to this, this space where uh, I thought about what I love the most and what we love the most, how an extended version of this thing could change all of that and what it might look like. Um, and technology was one thing that I could not try to talk about in there. So thank you for catching that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, it's just a strong current in the, in the book, which gave me a lot to think about myself and the ways in which you know, I have similar nostalgia, but also the ways in which I'm complicit because, you know, working now with Zoom and working from home, my phone is here, my computer is there, like you said, just that awareness, you know, of it all. I'm going to roll to a question that we have. Uh, Don Mason, uh, Don, thank you for joining us. Ask this question. I love your poetry. Uh, I'm curious about your term, Appalachia. I can see the components but can you please tell us a bit about what it means to you? Uh, what it means to me personally. I think for me, I love how it forces an immediate uh, redefinition of what most people have been taught that Appalachia is. Of, I love how it allows people born in the same space to claim that same space that before they had met, they may have been locked out of, you know, the, the, in 1991, 30 years ago, um, this is the 30th anniversary of the Appalachian Poets, happy anniversary to all of us. Um, but the dictionary definition of Appalachian was white residents of the mountainous regions of Appalachia. And I remember thinking, if you're not white, but also live there, what are you? If the definition says you, you aren't Appalachian, what are you? What could you be? Um, and I remember using that word in the poem uh, and how I may not have even appreciated the significance and power of it until I took it to my writing group. And they immediately said, we have to use that. You know, We didn't have a name, we were working as a group, but we didn't have a name. They said, let's call ourselves the Appalachian Poets. 
uh, I mean, as soon as they heard the word, they were like, that, that has some resonance, some power. Uh, and now 30 years later, um, people are still discovering the power of the word. I'm still discovering new Afro-Latins every day as I do the research. There's a book coming in, in the future that basically is Appalachia's gift to African-American history. And that gift includes luminaries like Nina Simone, uh, Jesse Owens, George Clinton is from Appalachia. So George Clinton is Appalachian, you know. Wow. Uh, which blew me away to find it out. And as I find out these amazing names and figures in, in history, uh, this, this treasure chest gets richer. You know, I consider the gifts from the region. And if people thought about, I mean, I, this is a full circular thing. The father of African American history and Black History Month is Carter G. Woodson, who's from Appalachia. Um, he mentored Langston Hughes. You know, one of the reasons history is so important in Langston was because of his mentor. You know, it's like we can reach in, even into the most treasured parts of African American history and extrapolate a connection to, to Appalachia, uh, which flies in the face of how the stereotype, the negative caricatures have survived for so long. And it's that successful divide and conquer because you've never read about Carter G. Woodson and Appalachia in the same space. It just doesn't happen. You know, even Booker T. Washington, maybe Henry Louis Gates, but Jesse Owens, gold medal winner, you know, Berlin Olympics and Appalachia, not the same conversation, you know. Uh, Nikki Giovanni, maybe, Sonia Sanchez, maybe, Angela Davis, never Appalachian in the same sense. So if you put all those names in the same space, you cannot see those negative caricatures that people still try to propagate. Um, and so that's, I mean, so that, that word, uh, I, mean, it, I mean, you can see I get excited about even talking about the historical significance of the word that it, it takes people in that direction you know, force you to define what you know, what you believe about those definitions and hopefully, you know, reshape it, you know, recontextualize it if, if nothing else uh, and find ways to stop, you know, letting the negative images and ideas be perpetuated. Uh, it is not a homogeneous white space. Uh, I mean, Negro League Baseball, August Wilson, I, mean, I could go on for an hour uh, about, you know, the luminaries that come out of that space that, really challenge those traditional definitions and ideas um, and are slowly, you know, seeping into academic spaces um, because most Appalachian studies programs around the country, uh, they are teaching diversity. You know, the, the, the national conference, there's always uh, elements of it that deal with diversity. So uh, that word gives me much pleasure. Thank you for whoever asked that question. Felt, felt. Um, okay, another question. Um, this is my dear friend and colleague, Brian Foster. Uh, Brian Foster asks, uh, he says, this was really moving, thank you. Could you talk about your creative process a little? And are there any ways that the last year has changed that process or your relationship to that process? I don't, you know, I don't accept this as a new reality. You know, I'm living in the moment. Um, you know, our institution is trying to rush us back into the classroom. Um, so I know that all this time that I enjoy that, that used to be eaten up by travel. You know, for me, one of the biggest, biggest gifts was that I didn't expect was when I realized that uh, all the time I spent dropping kids off, picking kids up, driving to campus, searching for parking space, walking to the classroom and office, walking back, driving home, you know, basketball practice, basketball games out of town. Uh, when I got all those hours back, I remember after the first week, I was like, I'm done for the day. It's 10 o'clock. <laughs> what do I do with the rest of the day? Uh, where did all this time come from? I was stunned when I had to sit down and realize how much time, not wasted, but how much time was spent just traveling, you know, with a, with a you know, big enough family, how much time you get back by not having to travel. Uh, 
And once I was able to wean myself uh, off of television and Netflix, I was like, look at, look at all this, you know, time, you know, what can I, how can I, can I use it? You know, so not only did I finish this book of poetry, uh, I dug out my fiction project and, and finished my novel. Finally, uh, it's somewhere on somebody's desk being edited. Uh, I finished my first children's book. Of, you know, I started working on two new projects of, this is not normal for me. I, I'm, I write a lot, uh, but I'm not that prolific. But it just made sense to me to believe that, you know, this might last six months. You know, how can I make, how can I make the best use of this time? And for me, writing fiction has always been hard because for me, I need ex long extended periods of time to process the stuff in my head, the lives, the characters in my head and get them to the page. I can write a poem in my head driving from one city to the next, but I can't write fiction like that. So suddenly I had this time again. Uh, you know, I was, my undergraduate experience, I was trained as a fiction writer, not as a poet. You know, poet was just an extra thing, but my life, my available time meant that all I could write were these smaller things that were too small for a short story, or even a, you know, experimental piece of fiction. They were just poems um, for 20 plus years, you know, so my life changed dramatically in, in the last year, of, but it's going to change back and I'm going to miss all that, that time. But I, hopefully I will learn something about, you know, how to be a better steward of my own time uh, to continue. Uh, but it was nice to, to, to get to know that fiction, Frank. I left out, I started making visual art again, you know. <laughs> right. yeah. I, I have visual art. I have nine pieces in three galleries right now. I never had time. I used to have to choose between writing or making visual art. Uh, there was no time to do both and have a job and a family and do some recreational stuff, you know, like biking or golfing. Uh, you just had to choose, you know. Uh, the pie, it was like a pie and a half. You, and you had one, pick one slice. Of, but I didn't have to choose, you know. I was able to find time to do all the things in a committed way that uh, still felt good and whole and healthy. Uh, and the productivity, the artistic production that came out of it uh, has been so rewarding. I'm always stunned when people say, you know, I just, when COVID hit, I couldn't write. And I hear that and I go, I could not write, you know. Uh, I could not not, I don't understand you know, I do understand how you could be so emotionally uh, overwhelmed that, you know, this writing seems like an extra thing to do uh, or to go into that emotional space and produce something worthwhile uh, and worthy of sharing. But for me, I mean, that's what I was already doing. I mean, I've been trained to look at all the hard, ugly, dark, monstrous, difficult stuff and try to make something good out of it, or at least pull the conversation out of it so that we can talk about it in the real world after being lifted by the poem. Um, so it's, you know, I would never say, you know, three more years of pandemic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, we made the best of it. And, and I, miss, I miss my students. I miss that face-to-face. -face. It's hard teaching creative writing through this window. Um, I hear that. You know, Another semester of having students you've never seen in person is just weird to me, you know? Uh, I imagine about this fall, and right now we've already committed, we have chosen classrooms, so I'm anticipating the real world for us returning because my second vaccine shot is coming up in 21 days. Uh, my wife's already vaccinated, you know? At some point they will allow 16 years old, younger to be vaccinated. Um, so there'll be some sim semblance of some semblance of that old reality, but it would never, we would never go back to where we were, you know? Right. Um, and for me, I'll never have that, pro t you know, time to produce ever again. Uh, so I, I knew that. So I think I made the best of it or tried to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, hearing you talk about the ways in which how much traveling, just simple errands, picking the kid up from school, taking him to basketball practice, 
how much of that takes out of our day, out of the pie, as you would say. Going to the grocery store. Going to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. The um, you know, I was on academic leave and I had just come back this semester. So, you know, I had been teaching for the past seven or eight months. So this was all new to me. And I was ready to leave the house an hour before I had to teach to park to get to my office to get my set my computer up. When actually I just had to walk to the other room, you know, <laughs> at one minute before it was time to teach, you know, I was already prepped. So mm-hmm. All right, I think this is, uh, we got time for one more question. Uh, one of our star MFA students, uh, a poet, uh, Sadia asks, what music have you been listening to and indulging as you put these poems together? Mm-hmm. Or put those poems together. You know, I, I'm not a, I can't listen to music and write because uh, anything with words in it sends me down a, a rabbit hole with something that just happened in that, that song. Um, I can listen to music, get in the mood. Uh, but for me, my process, I wake up every morning at 4.30. I have since high school. Uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of sleep disorder, I suppose, because when I say that out loud, people go, what's wrong with you? You know, uh, never use an alarm clock. Um, I just wake up, it's, you know, my, my brain wakes up first and I'm thinking about stuff. And then I have to get out of bed to write stuff down before I lose it. And so there's kind of a rush and a panic to capture this stuff that I think is, could be important. Uh, and by 8.30 in the morning, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm done. I, I put my eight hours in, uh, in four hours. And then I live the rest of my life. Uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a normal experience for me. Um, you know, but I mean, it's, it's, these, these are strange times. These are, uh, I love music. We listen to a lot of music in my house. Uh, my wife has a more eclectic taste than I do. Um, we miss live music. Uh, I mean, before COVID, we took the twins to the, their first large concert and we took them to see Stevie Wonder in concert and they were both amazed by you know an arena full of that many people who all knew the songs who were singing along like they do to their Disney uh, you know champions of and they were surprised at how good it was you know um, I couldn't tell them that all concerts aren't like that that there's only one Stevie Wonder you know uh, you know, but when Bill Withers died, um, I started listening to him again. And I hadn't listened to Bill Withers for almost two months before he died because somebody had sent me a link to uh, this younger brother who remade Bill Withers' albums, you know, or at least one album with all of his greatest hits. And I, the name escapes me at the moment, but it was so close. I thought you just couldn't do that. But this is a guy who Bill had endorsed and said, you know, I give you permission. You know, you, you know, that's how you sing that song. But he also had his own touch to it. But I'd been listening to the to the new old Bill with us until he passed away. Uh, and then I, I felt guilty, I think. Um, and so I listened to the authentic Bill. Uh, and December of last year, I was still listening to Authentic Bill. Um, and whatever, you know, um, my wife, her studies at the top of the house, kind of the third level uh, above the rest of the house. So she can look out and see the whole neighborhood. Uh, but we have a turntable up there. And so when she puts the music on, it comes down the stairwell and kind of spreads out in the house. Uh, so we've been buying a lot of, you know, that was the holidays, uh, vinyl gifts. Um, you know, so Valerie June is, is a standard in our house. Uh, you know, we, we love, I think, female vocalists, you know, uh, anything of, you know, Rihanna Giddings makes, you know, she did an album called, uh, I think, Native Daughters, My Native Daughters with three other women uh, musicians and, and, and vocalists that were just not just powerful because of the, the musicality, 
but because of the cultural references and history that is packed into them, which reminds me of a lot of my own work. So I can listen to two and, and just sink into that pain that she pulls out of me. Uh, I mean, it's very therapeutic uh, to experience those songs, uh, you know, uh, in silence and just let them just kind of seep into you and out. Um, you know, but so I don't, other than, you know, the individual songs that, that have, uh, has some value because, you know, it's like a modern protest song. Um, you know, we haven't bought much new music. Uh, you know, I might download a single song um, because it's, you know, it's, it's now an anthem to me. You know, I think about, um, you know, I think about my son making recommendations to me uh, and my daughter doing the same thing, you know, uh, not the two-year-old, obviously, but I have an older son and an older daughter. Um, who try to keep me current, you know, because they realized when they were teenagers that I would embarrass them in public and, and use words that were no longer involved. And they would write notes and say, or whisper, people don't say that anymore. Or please stop saying that. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so they, they try to keep me hip and, and current. Um, but, you know, we have a pretty significant jazz collection. You know, I like older jazz musicians. Um, you know, and my wife has always expanded my taste. You know, we obviously because uh, she's from Jamaica, we listen to a lot of world music. Um, she's taught abroad. Uh, and so we try to travel, we used to travel as much as we could. So, you know, I'm still growing as a, as a music fan. And, but I don't know how connected music is to my writing process, other than I use it emotionally, uh, therapeutically, but not to write with, uh, because my, my brain can't process that many words, uh, mine and theirs at the same time. It just, my brain's about this big, you know. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Afton, you want to jump in here? Yes. I don't believe you about your brain size, and I cannot believe your children don't think you're cool. I think that you're <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I think we were teenagers. That's right. That's right. You are really cool to the two-year-old, right? <laughs> you know, I think I'm a superhero to the two-year-old. Uh, and I have like superpowers because when he was sledding, he gets to the bottom and look at me like I was a ski lift. And he would say, carry me. <laughs> <laughs> so he thinks sledding has no work involved. It's like, we slide down, you get carried to the top, slide down again, get carried to the top, you know. That's right. Uh, How does your body tell you it feels? It's, it's uh, we have a deal. Tylenol. <laughs> tylenol. And a little uh, medicine. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why we connect so strongly. <laughs> I thought this was tea. Along <laughs> I said it was cold on this concrete. <laughs> you did. You had to warm it up. Warm it up. <laughs> yep. Hot toddy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Secret recipe, super weapon, hot toddy. Yes. Uh, oh, it's going to get interesting if we keep talking. No, thank you so much for your time today. I remember when I met you in 2018 in the summer during the Southern Foodways Alliance um, Summer Symposium. And I just, I was. It was so warm, warm then. It was so warm. <laughs> <laughs> it was so warm. And, um, your poetry, I, I, just your ability to, to relate on the page and, and bring life in situations happening to us all, um, putting those in words, I just can't thank you enough. So if you don't have it, everyone, you need to grab it, go to his website and grab it. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll see ya. Hey, thank you guys. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share and to see you. You know, I really, you know, uh, it's on the strength of your personalities that I said, I have to do this. There was no real hesitation. Um, I lost on me. But I, I really am serious. Post-COVID, you, you must invite me back. Okay. Uh, so I can bring my whole crew because uh, that's, how, that's how we roll. Uh, we, we'll make a road trip out of it, you know. Um, 
and I look forward to seeing you guys in person, seeing your families and, and being in your space uh, and sharing the word. Thank you. And thank you, Derek. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you.